number of top tier tenured professors, as well as people like Seven Wire and uh, Robert Gerber's uh, colleagues from Seven Wire coming on, Lee Shapiro and Glenn Tolman, uh, to talk about what they did with Lavongo and now what they're getting ready to do with Transparent. Uh, but uh, again, uh, Robert, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Good to see you, Stan. Good to see you too. And talk to us a little bit, of, give us a one minute sketch of your background and uh, a little bit about Seven Wire. Uh, sure. So uh, I've been an investor now almost 25 years since uh, mid to late 90s, uh, all focused on early stage healthcare and technology and their section thereof. Before that, spent 10 years on the operating side across a number of uh, high growth businesses where I spent time uh, pretty much wearing every hat there is in an organization. Um, and, uh, you know, as a firm, for those who don't know Seven Wire Ventures, we're, we're an early stage firm based in Chicago, focused on primarily uh, Series A investing in companies that create what we call informed connected health consumers. And so how do we work with enterprise stakeholders? So payers, providers, pharma, uh, self-funded employers and the like, but really with the idea of putting tools, technology information in the hands of us so we can actually be consumers and not patients. That's fantastic. And I think, you know, he's being modest when he talks about Seven Wire, like it's just another venture capital firm. Uh, it is... Pro, I, I can't think of a more successful firm that operates in digital health and not just in terms of just finding some of the most extraordinary digital health companies that are out there, but also helping them grow and, and, and uh, partnering with ecosystem stakeholders, whether they're health plans, employers, hospitals, or life science companies, or other venture firms and venture funds. And so I guess, congratulations to all the work, good work you guys are doing. Thank you. Appreciate it. And, um, you know, let, let's talk a little bit more about what you're seeing right now in the ecosystem around digital health. Uh, you guys are obviously scouting this like no one else. And, uh, you know, give, give the audience some idea of what you're seeing right now in this quasi pandemic, post pandemic kind of uh, purgatory <laughs> that we're in the midst of right now. Uh, what are you guys seeing for opportunities? Yeah, I mean, as you would expect, it's, it's been a little bit of a, of a, of a strange world where we have a pandemic on one side and we have rapid acceleration and change in healthcare on the other. And so it's been a busy year and a half or so since uh, lockdown occurred, but um, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, if we're looking for a silver lining, we've probably seen five to 10 years of acceleration. Um, um, so uh, that has helped, you know, core areas of interest continue to be, they were pre-pandemic and they continue to be chronic care, uh, behavioral health, uh, aging at home, obviously nobody wanted to put uh, a parent or a loved one in a, in a facility over the last year and a half, they could have avoided it. Um, you know, increasingly spending a little time in pediatrics and how do we address some of the gaps in care, both around primary care and behavioral health there. Um, recently made an investment in a company called Jasper Health, focused on improving the journey for people who are facing uh, uh, a cancer diagnosis and um, but, uh, you know, look, there's, there's never been a lack of problems to solve in healthcare, and that, that rings true today as always. Um, and so I, I don't think that we've necessarily changed our focus as much as uh, the pace of innovation around many of these big problems um, has, uh, has accelerated. And I think one of the things that you guys have that's, you know, not necessarily unique to venture capital, but you really do stick to it very carefully is this idea of really focusing on certain categories um, and talk a little bit about those those six primary categories that you're looking at and in terms of growing digitally uh, you know enable uh, like with the, the enabled care section of that um, and and talk about uh, which one is the has the greatest growth potential in this ecosystem that we're in today yeah it's, uh, which one has the best uh, growth potential is a little like trying to pick your favorite child um, so it's, it's a little hard, uh, but certainly we're seeing um, a lot of activity around all the virtual first models, um, some overlap there with digital therapeutics, which um, seem to be growing in maturity. Um, certainly uh, innovations around care delivery and primary care continues to be uh, an area where we're doing some deep dives and sort of what does that experience look like from a consumer perspective? And obviously we're not gonna live in this fully virtual world once we're uh, out of the deep water here. And so we've got new problems to solve around these hybrid models and how do we 
maintain care continuity and manage care in these sort of, sometimes you're in person, sometimes you're remote. Um, you know, then we're looking at new innovations around the home, right? Not just for aging, but hospital at home, chronic care at home. Uh, we've seen everything from innovations around home infusion for oncology to home dialysis. And so even the more acute things that typically fall in the four walls of a, of a, a hospital or ambulatory center are gonna end up in the house. Um, and then, you know, and then there are a lot of overlaps around specialization, right? So if we think about, you know, behavioral health or musculoskeletal or um, cardiovascular or um, autoimmune, you know, there are a lot of specializations which are horizontal and may go across multiple modalities of care. And so, you know, we can bucket it into a half a dozen, but it gets pretty complex and pretty intertwined quickly because, you know, there's no simple solution to these problems. Uh, no doubt about it. And I think, you know, certainly uh, the complexity of them is not lost on groups like yours. You know, just what you guys did with the Merck Global Innovation Fund and General Catalyst with the Livongo scale up IPO and sale to Teladoc, you know, uh, for 18.5 billion on 93 million in revenues. And then all, all the work that you're doing now with so many of these, these great companies. You mentioned chronic care at home care. So, and I, I think you guys know about the AARP uh, Hit Lab pitch challenge is coming up on July 15th from 4 to 6 p.m. Uh, hopefully, we'd love to have you on that as well. But that's, you know, uh, and I think we're seeing a lot of this, and you, you guys certainly know about the ARP Innovation Labs uh, as well, but the, the work that's going on in older, uh, older adult care, 50 plus care, that kind of thing, <clears throat> is that something that uh, you guys are seeing as one of those high growth elements right now? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think, um, the more proactive and the earlier we get in that journey, the better, right? You know, by the time people are far down the aging journey, they're complex, um, they're expensive, and uh, and you know, essentially, you're you're playing triage, right? We're you know, playing defense, and so we really want to think about how can we start playing offense here. And to your point, it's a very different journey if you start at 55 than if you start at 80, and you're dealing with there. You can start thinking about the welfare side of the equation, not just the sick care side of the equation. And how do we keep people out of the four walls of the hospital and help them stay healthier and connected? And so we avoid the downstream issues, not just around you know, dementia and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and these other things that typically impact us, but also around loneliness and isolation um, and, uh, and good mental health and fitness. And so start thinking about a little more holistically about how we think about the aging process and can we reinvent it so that people feel like, you know, this is not part of the end of life. This is just, you know, the middle part of life and we're investing, you know, um, in companies that address that, that transition from, you know, when you're in twenties, thirties to when you're in your fifties and then creating a longitudinal relationship with, with consumers throughout that journey. You know, I, I don't think any of us want to be patients and so we're trying to figure out what are the companies can help people be consumers and, you know, live their lives to the fullest and be healthy. Um, you know, the reality is for most of us, if we're fortunate, we spend relatively little time in the, in the, in the face to face with a provider or in the four walls of a hospital. And so, you know, we want to make sure that these solutions are transparent, um, proactive, predictive, um, and actionable, right? You know, like we don't want to feel helpless. Um, cogs in the system. We want to feel like we have control over our health and well-being. Brilliant. And, and I, one of the things that you guys are, are really good at is connecting with so much of the ecosystem. And, uh, you know, again, like <laughs> Lee was on in February for one of our Hit Lab uh, programs with uh, Sheila Collins, who is one of the leaders at the AARP Innovation Labs, and just always connecting with folks um, what, uh, when you are looking at the, the digital health, the complexity of the healthcare system to start with, then you layer digital <clears throat> into the system, which if you, uh, anyone who walks into a physician's office will see anywhere from one to 10 fax machines. So you know that healthcare is ripe for <laughs> disruption because the fax machine index is out of control in healthcare. But um, when you look at this, uh, this kind of movement, um, you know, the technology has a startup cost. <clears throat> and it's it's really incredible to see how big that is. Um, 
at, at what time and what kind of period do you see uh, the expense coming in for that startup cost as a venture capitalist? And what do you, um, uh, how do you measure uh, how that cost will affect the, uh, the customers and the ecosystem as a whole when you're trying to invest in it and figure out uh, how that startup cost will take place? Yeah, I mean, look, there, those are good questions with no easy answers. However, I would say a few things. One is certainly the, the cost to build a company today has never been lower. Ironically, I started in the mid 90s and we were building out server rooms and data rooms and buying Sun Microsystem equipment and EMC storage systems. And these are multi million dollar investments. And now it's available turnkey in the cloud. Um, and so, uh, that's really changed the, the calculus around um, the investment. And you can spend a lot more of your initial dollars building out commercial traction than you have to invest in building out um, technology infrastructure. Uh, that said, we're still seeing demands in the marketplace for you know, upwards of 5X ROIs on investments in these types of systems. And so you know, we have to be mindful that these are, that we see a clear path to hard dollar ROI. When I say hard dollar ROI, I mean, it's not enough to show reduction in absenteeism or increases in productivity. I mean, those are great, but we have to be able to see improvements in outcomes, reduce, um, reductions in cost, or improvements in quality and sort of that triple aim or some components of the triple aim um, to justify, you know, the, the investment. Um, you know, I, I think uh, where possible, we try to create models and look for companies which have relatively low fixed costs um, and most of the expenses on the variable side. And so that we can see a scalable model as companies grow, they have good unit economics. You know, I mean, obviously um, nobody wants to sell a dollar for 98 cents and make it up on volume. That's a pretty hard business model. Um, so I, I don't know if that helps, but I, I think the, the, the biggest hurdle is probably changing technology within the provider world, uh, as you know, they're very tied to the EMRs, which are primarily were built for billing, not for clinical care. Uh, and as you say, you know, because of HIPAA regulations and other, you know, we still have fax machines, which um, probably should have died 20 years ago. Uh, and I don't know how we're going to replace those overnight. Um, some of the new technologies, when you think about platforms like AI and ML are doing a nice job, actually, believe it or not, in the non-clinical side and automating some of the tasks that should be automated, claims adjudication, uh, you know, coding, transcription, those kinds of things. Um, and over time will are being incorporated in decision support systems. Um, but uh, it's it's painful and it's hard to change behavior. And I won't I won't pretend it's not. Fantastic. We've got uh, about two more minutes, and we've got a great question coming in from the gallery. <clears throat> it's talking about the the wait time uh, to get to specialists these days in general, but also uh, when you go to the ER. Uh, a lot of times, if you're in a remote part of America, <clears throat> you go to the ER and you need a specialist. There could be a call, a doctor on call that could be you know a couple hours away or something, and that's where you see companies like Call Doctor, you know, trying to make a difference there and things like that. Have you guys seen other technologies that are helping? reduce the, the, the lack of access to subspecialists and specialists in remote areas? Yeah, I mean, I think that's part of a larger problem, which is sort of, you know, twofold. One is an imbalance between supply and demand across lots of parts of healthcare and specialists is, is an area of particular acuity. I think the other thing is that, that clinicians aren't evenly distributed across our country. And so there are, there are, we see the same thing in Medicaid where there are certain specialties that simply don't exist within certain counties and many counties. Um, we've seen some companies, I think a lot of it has been designed around integrating telehealth into the ED or into primary care so that you can create virtual networks of specialty providers in other parts of the country, um, which is helping to alleviate that. I think the other, the other solution is trying to divert people from the ED to more appropriate points of care. And so, you know, obviously that's one of the holy grails is making sure that we're only having the most acute people um, filling the, the waiting room seats and the beds in the ED. Um, but it's, it's a work in process. I, you know, um, I, I don't think there's any quick fix to solving the, the rural healthcare issue other than leveraging technology to create um, virtual networks of people that are in different parts of the country. And 
um, and bringing the specialists in because, as you say, you know, you can't have someone two hours away and waiting for them. You can't have somebody having to drive two, three, four, or five hours to get to an academic medical center. That's not a scalable solution. Um, right. But well, uh, I, I haven't seen any magic bullet yet. Well, look, I have an idea. We'll get you and Glenn and Lee, Don and David together, and I think. Um, if it's like the uh, the Avengers, I think if we can get you guys together, we'll figure out. <laughs> we'll figure it all out. I do. Well, think I think you might give us too much credit, Stan. I and I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure if my superpowers extend there, but I'm willing to give it a shot. I don't know. You guys are doing great. Well, Robert, thank you again. Virtual applause from everybody in the gallery. Uh, just a tremendous amount of insights from Robert Garber. Uh, again, uh, just a. a